Hello and welcome to The Real Economy with a focus on the middle market and the economic headwinds facing it. I'm Gigi Stonewoods, your moderator for today. And we are joined with the famous Joe O'Neill of The Joe O'Neill Show, Joe Bruce Willis, RSM's chief economist, and Neil Bradley of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Thanks so much for being here today. Great to be here. A lot has changed since we last spoke. <laughs> it appears the economy is doing better than a lot of people expected. Is this what a soft landing looks like? You know, if you wanted to, to get together and talk about a happy holidays and a prosperous new year, that's exactly where I'd want to start because that's what we're going to get. The U.S. economy is not in recession and it's likely to not fall into one. And it does look to me like that much fabled soft landing is going to be obtained by the Federal Reserve. You know, when we take a look at growth, employment, and inflation, it's hard not to be optimistic about what's happening, not only in the real economy amongst our mid-market clients, but across the economy looking forward in the next year. Right now in the current quarter, the economy's tracking at about 2.6% growth. I mean, that's well above the long-term trend of 1.8%. Unemployment is sitting at 3.7%. We've had unemployment <clears throat> below 4% for 22 months. We haven't seen that in 50 years. And the pace at which inflation, that's growth in pricing, is easing is also surprising in such a way that the Federal Reserve recently pivoted and told us that we all have rates coming, rate cuts coming in our Christmas stockings for next year. So we, things are just looking very, very optimistic right now, much better than one year ago where we were talking about probabilities of recession and risks. This, this is truly uh, the end of a year where the economy is going to grow probably at about 3%. We just simply continue to outperform. And, you know, considering we started the year talking about the R word, recession, well, we're ending the year talking about resilience. And that's about as good as it gets. Yeah, when we talk to our members, demand is still strong. So they're seeing it in their individual businesses. Uh, yeah, they're complaining about interest rates and, and the cost of, of capital. I guess that's what happens when you begin to normalize uh, interest rates, so not unexpected. But importantly, they're still investing. They're particularly making investments where they see opportunities for efficiency gains. And so they're looking at those tight labor markets that Joe just talked about, sustained demand. And so how, how do you meet that demand in a tight labor market? How do you take advantage of AI and all the things that are coming online? You make those capital investments. That, of course, helps support the overall economy. And it, uh, it feels like a pretty comfortable landing um, from where we sit. You know, and it's that improvement in supply across the board, whether it's the normalization of domestic and global supply chains, that very impressive flow of private capital into tech to take advantage of AI, or even the government-inspired stuff that caused literally $130 billion of investment into manufacturing, right? We haven't even seen those numbers as a percentage of GDP since 58. That's President Eisenhower, not President Biden. So these are really historic things that are happening. And again, it's, it's hard not to be optimistic right now. I was talking to a, a power company. Um, I, I won't say which one, but they, they operate in the middle of the country. Um, so we're not, we're not on the coasts here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a mid-size, what people would generally consider Rust Belt city. Their biggest problem is the demand that they're getting for electric hookups. It is breaking records because to Joe's point, this manufacturing started with one facility, now it's expanding out further. Data centers that we used to think about just for social media, and et cetera, now expanding into AI. Their biggest challenge is figuring out how they're gonna meet all that demand for, uh, for energy. And this is extraordinary. For most of our career arcs, growth in the United States has been driven almost exclusively through the financial center. We financialize the economy in order to boost risk-taking activity. This is the real economy. This is happening from the inside out. That's why we can't overemphasize that that increase in supply, which is now bringing inflation back to tolerable levels, over the medium to long term, will boost productivity. It'll raise standards of living. Moreover, these firms out there that are adjusting to higher rates of finance won't be capital starved because risk taking will actually improve on the backside of this. So much positive data, so much yep. uh, positive information, but you know, the Fed is still keeping a close eye on inflation and what's causing inflation. What's your take on, we talked about a little bit, public sentiment and the economic outlook in general. So public sentiment right now is, is 
largely sour on the economy because of the shock to the price level. Now, my, my sort of anecdote I'm using as I go around and talk to people in North America is price of eggs. It's down 22% on a year ago basis. Yet compared to 2019, the price level is 22% higher than it was. Yeah, people aren't feeling it. Economists and firm managers, firm owners, they talk about the growth in prices, but the public talks about the price level. Exactly. Now, day before Thanksgiving, I'm at a place called Central Market in Austin. I walk in, I, and I saw a sign. It said, you buy a dozen eggs, you get a pound of bacon free. So I <laughs> talked to them, and they're like, we've got more eggs and bacon than we're going to be able to sell. Yeah. These prices are coming down. And I thought, OK. Now that's, that's a good not, sign. That's a good sign. That's where you want to be heading into the holidays. But that's why we've seen actually the, both the University of Michigan's Consumer Confidence Survey and then the Conference Board's Consumer Sentiment Survey this morning just released some big jumps. That's largely a function of a really tight labor market and then gasoline prices coming down. We haven't really talked enough about gasoline prices. You know, where I live in Texas, it's $2.50 a gallon less than $3 a gallon for premium unleaded. These are improvements that over time, they reshape and reset expectations. And I think, you know, by the middle of next year, the consumers are gonna have a very different outlook on the economy than they have now. We do surveys of, of business owners, uh, small and, and, and mid-sized business owners. And there's something remarkable going on, I think, in the trends that we're gonna have to watch over the long term. And, and it, we're really breaking down how business owners say they view the world. If you ask them about the national economy, it's in the tank. We're, they, don't, they think we're already in a recession yeah. nationally. Okay, well, how do you feel about your local economy and where you're operating? Well, it, it's pretty good, but you know, I'm worried about it, right? So I'm, I'm skittish, but you know, I'm, it's not in a recession. How about your business? Oh. I can't meet demand. <laughs> like my, my biggest problem yeah. is mm -hmm. that we have no way to meet everything. And so, and that's replicated all over the place. And so for some reason, we've kind of uh, 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 divorced our view of what's happening nationally. And in some ways, what's happening even in our own communities from what we actually know and see happening in our lives. And the best information is what we know is happening in our own lives as a business owner. We're just assuming that these business owners are assuming they're, ex they're the exception rather than the rule. And I think that that idea, because you know, we talk to our clients all the time, that recession for thee, not for me, that's going to end pretty quickly as financing costs come down. You know, Just during this year, we've met at a time when mortgages 30-year mortgage was 8%. People rightly were upset about that. It's back down to 6.83% as of this morning, and it's going to go lower. And as we see those financing costs reset back to the, their, what we will call the new normal, uh, sentiment will improve. So everyone's watching what, of course, the Fed is going to do next, yeah. when the rate cuts are going to start, how many we're going to see. And Joe, we do have to congratulate you. Bloomberg oh. named you, along with Goldman Sachs, as the most accurate interest rate forecaster in 2023. I looked down because I wanted to make sure to get the wording Thank right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we have to ask you what your yep. prediction is. Okay, so the Fed's told us that they're going to cut rates three times, but they didn't say when it was going to start. So Fed's got 75 basis points of rate cuts on the table. My sense is, is that we get actually 100 mm -hmm. starting in June because we're going to see a quicker decline in overall price level growth, meaning we're going to get to that fabled 2.5% on the core policy variable, the PCE data, um, probably a little bit quicker than what the Fed forecast implies. And that will give the Fed space to make rates less restrictive. And at the end of the day, that's what's really important. With the federal funds rate between 5.2 and 5.5%, that's very restrictive. And they need to get that lower sooner rather than later to engineer not just that soft landing, but the reacceleration after they touch down on the runway, right? We're gonna wanna see that. So what we think is most of the action is gonna be at the front end of the curve. As the Fed over two years moves the policy rate back to somewhere between two and a half and 3%, and we think out at the longer end, 10 year, we're going to end between 4.25 and 4.5 this year. Now, the market's pricing in 175 basis points of rate cuts. As of this morning, dollar swaps tell us that the rates are going to be around 3.7%. I don't think so. That's more along the lines of an economy that's tipping over, not one that's accelerating.
But the important point is we're going to have a steeper yield curve. Improved net interest margin helps with financing, will bolster demand, and you'll see firms that take advantage of those improved supply side conditions. Risk appetite will reignite, and we're going to see deals. I think second half of next year, you'll see M&A begin to take off. You'll see IPOs in the pipeline, and that's what will really, I think, stoke business confidence. A lot of dry powder on the side. Yeah, so there's an enormous dry powder, four trillion in just terms of risk capital. There's nine trillion sitting in money market accounts. You know, even this morning I saw CEO sentiment jump from 50 percent, which was coin flip on whether we're going to do well or not next year to 58%, which is we're getting ready to take risks. Uh, this is encouraging and constructive news. And how is that going to affect policy going forward? Well, <laughs> policy could be both a, a headwind and a tailwind in, in this dynamic. So um, we have kind of a new uncharted air, speaking of M&A, about the government's views. Um, you know, just uh, this past week, uh, they issued new uh, merger and acquisition guidelines. And it's creating a lot of uncertainty in the level of information that they're asking, even from routine kind of mid-sized mergers. Now, that said, that's going to be a bump in the road. I don't think it's going to be a roadblock to the deals that companies want to do, but they're going to have to figure out that and navigate it. And so it's more uh, kind of sand uh, in the gears that may slow down some of those transactions or at least add to the, to the, the transactional costs of it. You know, on the government side, we're heading into an election year and people are going to have to really separate out the campaign rhetoric from what's really going to happen. And I think we're going to hear lots of rhetoric about directions of policies that aren't likely, no matter what kind of makeup we get out of the government out of November, uh, to materialize. And so a key will be people not overreacting or not becoming frozen in place because they don't know the fundamental direction of policy. The, the, the fundamentals of what any government will have to deal with after this next election remain that you have to deal with our growing debt and deficit, which has to do with how much paper the government is financing and pushing out there, a massive tax cliff, and how we sustain the investments that we've started making over the last several years in infrastructure, semiconductors, et cetera. The whole world is watching our presidential election as well as what's going to happen to Congress. So we have a lot of scenarios that could play mm -hmm. out. Uh, where do you even see things going? What are the possibilities? So in a normal political environment, uh, about a year out, we at the chamber would be plotting three potential scenarios for an outcome with the presidency on the line and control of the House and the Senate. We are currently carrying six scenarios, so twice the number, um, because everything is on a knife's edge. Um, if you look at the presidential election, you know, we, everyone talks about the, the national polls, but we don't elect a president via national polls. At the end of the day, this is probably going to come down to about four states, about 12 counties in those four states, and really about four counties, one county each in those states that are ultimately going to decide the election. If you look at the Senate, it's 51-49 today. With Manchin's retirement, it's 50-50. Which, which way do the other seats go? It could literally go either way. It could stay 50-50 with the vice president breaking the tie. In the House, we went from five-seat Dems to five-seat Republicans. We're going to bounce between you know the, that 10-seat spread, and it could really come down either direction. So um, as one commentator said we were doing some work with, it's quite possible that we have the complete switcheroo. The House goes from Republican to Democrat. The Senate goes from uh, Democrat to Republican. And the White House switches parties as well. That never happens in our politics, but it's a very real possibility. Everything is unprecedented. At Everything this point. is unprecedented. Um, we, we're so polarized as a country. What kind of concerns do you have on the economic outlook because of the way um, that we're so politically well, polarized? Well, it's clear that if, if the election gets more contentious than even the last two have been, that there could be a pullback in, in investment by firms, there could be a pullback in hiring, and the public then gets a little bit worried and they pull back on spending, right? The main risks around the outlook, 
have to do with oil and energy, although that's been that's significantly improved. And then globalization is clearly slowing. Some of the trade and transportation issues that we're reading about in the paper, you know, but those seem manageable. My, my, my main concerns are twofold. One, Neil mentioned the tax cliff that's coming in 2025. You know, here in town, clearly, there's already uh, advanced planning in both parties on what to do in that case. And we're gonna, you're gonna hear a lot about that from us over the next year to prepare our clients, to prepare the mid-market and everybody out there in the real economy for that cliff. And then second, you know, the, we're gonna get an echo from the pandemic era. In 2020, we had an unusual set of conditions whereby corporates could issue quite a bit of debt at incredibly low, historically low interest rates. That five-year vintage is gonna be need to be rolled year after next. And so that's gonna create conditions where the Federal Reserve will have to cut rates. We'll have to get real rates back down, right around one, one and a half percent from the two and a half to three we have now. And then um, we're gonna need private equity and private credit to step in and fill the gap where some of those loans won't get rolled. And that's gonna be a policy issue here in Washington because private equity is not really in favor amongst either Democrats or Republicans, but we're gonna need them to play a really unique role in the transition to this new era, this new yet undefined unnamed era that we're entering in the US economy. You mentioned geopolitical risk yeah. um, as one of the things that could derail the economy. Uh, the big story right now, of course, is the Red Sea, and I'm sure people are curious to know how much of an impact that could have. Uh, I heard someone say that the Red Sea hasn't gotten this much attention since uh, the <laughs> Lord parted it from Moses. So what kind of concerns do we have about the Middle East and uh, putting pressure on the economy? As of noon Eastern today, there are 100 ships who are gonna reroute around the Horn of Africa. That's an extra 10 to 14 days. That's just increased cost, and that tends to feed, feed through the inflation channel, both globally and domestically. Now, those, ma those risks are manageable, but with the U.S. and its allies putting together uh, a coalition to, to patrol the Red Sea, hopefully that tamps down those, those, those tensions. The United States did this in the 1988 uh, war between Iran and Iraq, so there's, there's precedence for this. And I'm confident that that will get done, but nevertheless, that is going to be part of the economic narrative early in 2024, until things calm down a bit. And so is China. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. an, a looming economic threat, concerns about Taiwan, um, debt deleveraging, mm -hmm. all of these issues. Um, what are we looking at in terms of uh, China? Okay, so China, they've entered a long-term period of debt and deleveraging. They've got a debt overhang in their banking system that's hitting both residential and commercial real estate. Their youth unemployment's now above 20%. Once a debt and deleveraging crisis starts, it tends to take seven to 10 years to play out. So the China we've talked about as an economic risk, that's gonna change a bit. Moreover, the fiscal and monetary authority have sent clear signals that they're going to increase funding to Chinese manufacturers to ramp up production of domestic supply that their consumers don't have the wherewithal to absorb. Therefore, there's going to be a cheap wave of goods coming out of China over the next two to three years, likely accompanied by devaluation or depreciation of their currency. They're gonna export their burden of adjustment and deflation into the global economy. Now, there are other countries, both their major trading partners, which the United States isn't really that big of a deal for them, who aren't going to accept a reduction in their overall share of regional and global manufacturing. So trade tensions are going to rise, right? And of course, here, we will see those goods arrive in places like Target and Walmart. Now, from the purely economic and financial perspective, I don't have a problem with the decline in price of goods that largely serves our down market population, but because trade with China has been so politicized. I expect those tensions to reignite. They'll probably be part of the election commentary next year. And certainly the policy landscape, whom, whatever the configuration of power is in Washington in 2025. But this isn't going to go away because that debt and deleveraging crisis is deadly as a heart attack, just as what we went through between 2007 and 2014 and what the, the Japanese went through during the entire 1990s. 
to Joe's point, if you look at uh, what's happening in Washington right now, the Bipartisan Select Committee on China just issued a report, and amongst a lot of good recommendations, but one of them is effectively repeal of PNTR, which snaps back all tariffs. And so you stop being strategic about the things that might cause the national security concern and all that stuff that's going into a Walmart or a Target that's helping support uh, mm -hmm. U.S. consumers suddenly has a massive tariff put on it, which is a huge disruption. I think one of the things, if you link those threads that we just talked about together, it really makes resiliency in your supply chains yeah. that much more important. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're quickly moving into a world in which you have to assume multiple disruptions for various different causes all at the same time. So we talked about the, the ships going around the, uh, the Horn of Africa as a result of what's going on in the Red Sea. Okay, you think, well, I could protect myself from that if I was locating my supply chain here in North America. Except at the exact same time, for completely unrelated reasons, we have a week-long shutdown of the two major rail passages between Mexico and the United States, about $200 million worth of cargo every single day. If you add it in, as you refer to, something uh, with Taiwan and then the Sea of Japan, uh, in those areas, you're talking about disruptions for vastly different reasons, all occurring at the same time, which means you really have to plan for having multiple resiliencies in your supply chain. It's great advice. What other tips do you have for businesses trying to prepare to navigate these waters? Well, I think the most important thing is, in addition to that, is lots of scenario planning. We've done a lot of work with our members uh, you know, uh, at the chamber where we're planning out for, in fact, we did an exercise unbeknownst uh, two weeks ago where we walked through what would happen if the Suez, in this case, we did the Suez Canal, so this is a little further south, but same situation. What happened if we couldn't get through the Suez Canal? for an extended period of time. And what would that do to commerce? And then you add on that what else could happen at the same time. I think you just have to do that kind of uh, game plan scenario if you want to be prepared. Yeah, multiple, multiple gaming out of scenario analysis, understanding that it's not just geopolitical tensions, it's environmental issues down in the Panama Canal. The one thing though that, that's sort of turned in, in the favor of firms is the cost of shipping has absolutely just collapsed and there are alternatives now. So they, they can move lo locations, they can get alternative supply chains, tap those alternative supply chains to get those goods. But it does require a bit of uh, planning, foresight, and a little luck. Speaking of alternatives yeah. uh, presented to businesses, the AI market and the way that the world is adapting to it so quickly and the way that it is changing so quickly is almost impossible uh, for businesses to prepare for. And yet they're slowly starting to do, or actually rather quickly starting to do a good job of that with a lot of questions. So where are you seeing AI in terms of the landscape? I don't know if they're preparing for it. My advice is jump into the pool and get in quickly and start swimming in the deep end, right? What, what we talked to companies that there was, uh, you know, this conversation nine months ago, it was all about, well, I don't know, we gotta find the right framework and we're gonna have to figure out what we're gonna to allow to do and have we made sure that we've protected our proprietary information? All important questions. While people are debating that internally, your competitors are moving yeah. forward and figuring it out and deploying AI. And even people that you wouldn't consider your competitors today, but who aspire to be, who are leapfrogging in AI. One of the most incredible conversations that we've been having isn't with well-established, mid-sized firms or even larger firms. It's with small, uh, small business operations. So we're talking you know, 50 uh, uh, people, maybe 100 people. They have figured out AI. They're figuring out how to expand their market share and they are using it to gain efficiency that they are using to cut prices. Then they're gonna come in and undercut you. So if you let them get an advantage of you in that way, you are gonna be playing catch up <clears throat> and I don't know if you'll be able to catch up. You so can't I just, put your head in the sand. You've got yeah, to adopt it. You've got to. I just spent a week out in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, and the main takeaway is three things. Engage, adopt, and innovate. E-A-I is the acronym that I'm using when I talk to our clients because you can't afford to fall behind the curve in this one. This cycle's moving at a different pace. There's a breadth and depth that wasn't there in past uh, tech 
positive, positive productivity cycles. Yeah, this one's going to move quite quickly. And we're, we're getting to the point where the, the, the machine learning is turned into generative AI, which will quickly turn into what's being talked about as Q-star, or you know, very sophisticated artificial intelligence that will be the game changer. And so that's why, we're, as I go through in a very patient, methodical way, speaking with clients, urging them to move now. Yeah, Elon Musk was saying with uh, Q-Star, the potential for compu the s computer to be smartest than the smartest man, yeah. smarter than the smartest man is within less than three years. Right, that the ability to conduct complex mathematical operations is such that um, some very difficult scientific problems will begin to be solved. And then where it's the time of partnership between ourselves and the computers. It's Think about what that can do, right? Yeah. Think about the time it takes right now to develop a new medicine to yeah. treat a genetic abnormality or something like that. In part because we don't have the computational power to figure out how to isolate the problematic genes, what to do to address them. We are going to be able to dramatically shorten just not only the research window, uh, but your, your, your trials, your time for, for clinical trials is going to become shortened because we'll be able to do data faster. So the, 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 the benefits not just in business efficiency, but just life improvements is really going to be remarkable. I think about um, 20 years ago, we used to run Monte Carlo simulations when looking at the U.S. economy. And we'd say, let's spin the model, and it would run 70,000 times. And we thought, wow, aren't we very, very sophisticated what we can do with machine learning is run the millions and millions of times. It reduces the standard error and then creates the conditions whereby we can begin to solve some of those problems. And we, I mean, I've seen this all within a 15 year career cycle. It's, real, it's fascinating stuff. I think we'll go to audience questions right now. Um, will QT continue to have a muted effect on rates and markets? This is from a Matt M. Are its effect not yet felt, given the Fed started hiking a bit more than 18 months ago? QT is evolving exactly as it should be. It's like watching the paint dry. <laughs> now, I know if you're in the housing market, if you're in portions of finance that is, has broad exposure into residential construction, this isn't something that somebody wants to hear. But it's actually the, the execution on the policy side has been nothing short of magnificent here. My sense is it may end by the end of next year. But we're not quite there with calling that yet. But one would think there may be a point where it slows. And then that, that of course, is, is a, a very constructive and encouraging thing that will uh, unleash a little bit of risk appetite in the housing market. All right. Uh, we have Michael saying, given the stickiness of labor costs, property taxes, et cetera, what level of inflation do you believe we will settle into for next year? 2.5%. We're not going back to 2%. The shocks of the pandemic, the changes in the structure of the economy, the, the labor tightness, which this is not our grandfather's labor market. We're not going to 6 or 8% unemployment. We're going to be right around 4 And then those geopolitical tensions that you rightfully pointed to all suggest that just the cost of everything is just going to be a little bit more expensive. And the truth is we need a quicker churn of the economy in any case to compensate for some of the, the longer term demographic challenges we have in the retirement of the boomers. And I don't know if you agree or not, but it feels like two and a half percent is like real success. When we were yes. talking about resetting, yes. you know, the old 2% benchmark, yes. people were like, well, maybe we're just going to have to settle for three. No. three quarter. No, we're landing in a pretty good spot when you think about what the realm of possibilities mm -hmm. were and the fact that 2% was never in this type of environment really So if you're out there and you're you're dialed into the broadcast on Friday morning the personal income personal spending personal consumer or PCE deflator is going to come out look inside the report and look at the 3 month annualized pace the si and the 6 month annualized pace of inflation because what you're likely to see is about 2% on the 3 month and 1.6% on the 6 month that gives you a sense of the inflation in the pipeline, and that in and of itself will trigger about a risk taking that will likely roll into early part of next year. And we rarely talk about the high frequency data, but everybody should take a stop, whatever they're doing, 8.30 Eastern, take a look at where that is, those numbers are, 
because that's a sign of coming attractions next year. And you're right, 2.5%, well, is victory. Yep. Another risk that we haven't talked about uh, that I still think is very interesting and looming is the commercial real estate market. <sighs> And you know all of these office building owners who thought vacancy rates were going to go up are still not seeing it in the near term future. Uh, how is that potentially going to steamroll and affect things? Okay, first let me just lay this out. This it's a risk, but it's not a systemic risk. It's not going to tip the economy over on a national macro basis. In some locations, though, the challenges are going to be a little bit more stiff than others. You know, in New York and San Francisco, that's where stuff happens. People are going to come back. Those, those, that office space is going to fill up. Other places, say like Houston, where like roughly I think 24% of all CRE square footage is empty, that may take a while. And so it's just going to be metropolitan area by metropolitan area. And of course, outside those major metro areas, there's going to be some adjustments. They have these like incredibly long-term leases. Yeah. So when those start to expire and these landlords possibly default on their debt, will that have economic implications? It will, but mostly it's going to be local. Again, it's just not big enough to turn things over. Okay. Anecdotal, but we've been talking in some of these smaller towns, yeah. you know, talking about 100, 200,000 people. Um, and when you talk to the, the, the local banks, what you find is they have exposure but they have a lot of diversification in uh, their commercial uh, real estate lending. So you're looking at multifamily housing, yep. fine, doing just fine. You're talking about um, uh, retail, particularly in the su suburb areas, which is doing just fine for all the reasons that we talked about in the consumers. So you're right, it, it's a problem, but this is not massive swaths of uh, our, our financial system going belly up because of their level of exposure to commercial real estate. So this is not it's a the, hiccup, it's yeah, not a... This is not the savings and loan crisis right. of the late 80s, early right. 90s, and it is not the great financial crisis where the banking system came perilously close to collapsing. As we've got an orderly workout system here on a case-by-case -case basis, and I mentioned earlier that prequin data that's showing that there's four trillion in dry powder just sitting there, two and a half of it, two and a half trillion in, pri in private equity alone. So I think that there's more than enough capital to address what's going to be a gradual and orderly workout of some LLCs that are just going to go bankrupt. I'm right? just playing devil's advocate. No, no, it's a great question. <laughs> because of the unique circumstances around the great financial crisis, where we had to do things that we normally wouldn't, and then again during the pandemic, there's this idea that no one's allowed to fail in capitalism. Well, that's like religion without hell. There needs to be some failures. It's what we call creative destruction. It's that churn. You know, we uh, destroy 5.2 million jobs, or 5 million jobs every month. And we create about 5.2 million, which is why we add about 200,000 jobs a month. But we don't really tell the civilians that, because you guys are destroying 5 million jobs a month? Well, wait a second, that's <laughs> insane. That's just how this works. Yeah. The business cycle. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned local banks, and it was just yeah. around this time last year that we were talking about Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, so where are we in terms of uh, regional local banks and how they're faring? There are 4,100 local and regional banks. Less than 1% of them are anywhere near impaid, impaired. And again, this is what you should expect in an economy that's now stepping up that churn, right? Federal Reserve put in the term bank financing program it's there, we are seeing banks tap that program. As a matter of fact, it's the highest it's been since last April, but that means it's working, right? We wanna have an orderly adjustment process, and sometimes it does involve or require the Federal Reserve to take a much more active involvement in the banking system than they normally would prefer or we would normally prefer. But as we read the term structure of interest rates, sets higher from we were between 0% and 2% for two decades. We're now going to be between 3 and 5% going forward. There's going to be an adjustment. And if you, in terms of interventions, this yeah. is probably one of the lightest types of interventions one could possibly have. And so we are, we are still talking about treasuries here and yeah. you know, people who just got caught, in part because 
at some point, interest rates had to normalize at some point. Mm -hmm. Just no one knew when. And, you know, and we, I think we turned, it turns out that when has been the last year. On a policy, from a policy perspective, it's important that we have a dynamic and uh, a dynamic local and regional banking system that plays a role in funding businesses that normally wouldn't get attention from J.P. Morgan or Bank of America. It's in the national interest that it, that continues. I don't think it would be in anybody's best interest if the banking system in the United States would look like that in Europe, where you just got a small number of national champions and everybody just has to sort of go with that. No, we've got a more dynamic, rich mosaic financially because of those local and regional banks. And it's in my opinion that that continue. And it's why it's good that the Fed took the steps that they did to maintain that. Because if they didn't, the, the banking system would narrow. And I, again, I don't think that's in anybody's best interest. Neil, you mentioned government infrastructure projects earlier. Where are we in terms of government spending, investment, infrastructure, and what concerns do we have about uh, making sure that that all keeps going? Well, let, let's talk about the money that Congress put up. Um, it is very, very slowly beginning to flow out. We've had some allocations, but in terms of shovels in the ground and dirt being turned, or um, uh, there was a story, a report in the last month about the EV charging stations. The, the, uh, we see a lot of EV charging stations being built. Almost all of that's with private money right now, the, the money that the government put in the infrastructure bill. It just takes forever. And in fact, we haven't yet built one of those new EV charging stations with the, with the government money. Yeah. That said, it's coming, right? And so this is a, a bit of a problem of federal permitting and federal bureaucracy. It also means that when we think about the larger economy and when we think about the timing in which the investments that the federal government has committed to will actually start turning into jobs and turning into shovels and steel and all the things that the real economy thrives on, that's gonna be really hitting this year and continuing into next year. And I think that's a good support when we think about any softness that we don't currently see, but that could, if it were to materialize, will help address it. So when I think about the, the government investment and government spending, I think of a, a triangle. The base, you have the economics and finance. At the top, you have politics. So I'm an expert on the economics and finance of this. We don't have failed auctions. The debt issuances are going off, right? There's strong demand. Rates are actually coming down, right? Rates are down 20, I mean, a full 100 basis points, which helps significantly on the management of interest rate and expenses. When I look at household debt obligations, a percentage of personal income or disposable income, it's at multi-decade lows. I mean, we're in a good spot here. Now, that doesn't mean the government should spend like a drunken sailor in San Francisco. Um, if we're gonna spend, it's best that it's on this investment mm -hmm. that Neil's been pointing out, right? The rebuilding of the infrastructure, making the supply chains resilient, and then starting down the road on a sustainable environment and economy. But they have to make sure that it's targeted towards something you're gonna get a better return on. As long as that's going on, then we'll be okay. And my sense is as the economy continues to grow that uh, the level of uh, deficits will also narrow. But this is going to be more of a political question going forward than a, a question of the sustainability of economics and finance. That's not even a question. We're gonna be able to do this. But again, that's separate and distinct from what I just talked about. This is an important point. Politicians want speed, right? So they're on two-year election cycles. They want to know, I voted for something 12 months ago. I want to see that new bridge is already done, right? And I can take care of it. It doesn't work that way. And in fact, we don't want it to work that way. At times when we have tried to accelerate uh, government spending infrastructure projects is when we pave a street and then tear it up and then repave it again and then tear it up and repave it again. You can spend a lot of money that way and we've had past precedent where we've done that, but you are not creating any efficiencies that are gonna help the economy over the long term. So from a thinking about the future standpoint, I'm kinda happy that the politicians are frustrated 
that the investment's not happening quick enough. And speaking about the future, you mentioned those uh, electric vehicle charging stations mm -hmm. being slow to uh, be built. And I am fascinated with the effect on electric vehicle sales. Is it because their prices are high? Is it because tax incentives uh, are drying up? Is it because those charging stations are slow to come by? And what's happening with that market and how it's affecting the It's a highly market? segmented market yeah. tilted towards the upper quintile of income earners. It's the expiration of the, the tax incentives. And I, my sense is um, that cohort is waiting for the next round of uh, electric vehicles. Um, GM is going to issue quite the sophisticated EV SUV. I've had the privilege of taking a look at it. I wouldn't be buying an automobile yet either if I'm going to get an EV. I'm waiting till 2026 for those to show up at the market because it's several orders of magnitude better than, say, a Tesla, which is a fine automobile, which is just an electric automobile with an iPad in it. These are qualitatively and quantitatively different. Let me give you three reasons. The first is the growth that you initially saw to Joe's point yep. was a surge in the early adopters. And there are a lot of early adopters, but they're just one small segment of the market. For this to be a thriving market, you have to expand beyond that. Second, uh, the, the tax credits are changing. So we went from a tax credit that you claimed when you file your tax returns the next year, valuable, but doesn't really help you with the upfront cost of the car which further compartmentalize that segment of early adopters. Next year, you're gonna be able to get that tax uh, refund, that the tax credit applied at the dealership. Even if you're buying a used EV, there's a, a tax credit there, that's gonna expand who can do it. And then the third, there still exists range anxiety for a lot of people, particularly outside of the early adopters, and what is happening on charging stations, what's happening in the improvements in the car that Joe talked about, I think is going to accelerate that. So I think people may be making a little bit too much of what's happening at this precise moment in time and suggesting mm -hmm. that that tells a longer term story. And I, I, I don't think that's true. It's still going to happen. It's still happening. Before we close, I have to ask you, what do you want businesses and executives to know? What do you want to make sure um, they're paying attention to going forward? Financing rates have stabilized and now are going to make a long journey down. The conditions are coalescing to continue making productivity, enhancing investment in software, equipment, and intellectual property. It's critical given the accelerating pace of the innovation cycle that we spoke of earlier that they do this because they will fall behind. The competition, it's gonna be hyper competitive going forward. Uh, we, we talked about this during the pandemic that we thought this is what it would look like. It does, and it's happening. So they, the time is now. Yeah, three things. Uh, efficiency, to Joe's point, that, that means the investments. Two, resiliency, it is a complicated world that's getting more complicated. And so you better have resiliency built into your operations at a level that you've never had to before. Um, the third, unfortunately, uh, I guess I would say is you have to have one eye on what's happening in government. Um, and uh, the, as a result of decisions that have been made over the past several years, as a result of the polarization that, that we talked about earlier, we're in an environment in which government policy is ping-ponging back and forth and you have to have some sense of where it might end up so that you can make those plans to improve efficiency, so that you can make those plans to improve your resiliency, so that you can generate better profits over the long term. Resiliency, efficiency, keeping an eye on innovation, and keeping an eye on government. Great advice to take away with us and great discussion of the changing economic landscape as always, very informative. Thank you to Neil Bradley of the Chamber of Commerce and Joe Bruce Willis, RSM's chief economist, and thank you for watching The Real Economy.